Great, welcome to all of you to this panel towards a new social contract. I'm Akiko Fujita with Yahoo Finance. Really excited to be having this discussion today, taking a closer look at the challenges facing underserved communities across the world. And, and certainly a timely conversation given that we have seen a dramatic divide open up over the last 18 months of this pandemic. These communities have experienced high levels of unemployment, and unprecedented levels of instability. And those that have continued to work throughout the pandemic have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, really highlighting the inadequate safety nets available uh, for those that are most vulnerable. So with that said, there are a number of questions we're really looking to explore in this discussion today. Number one, how do we leverage this moment of crisis to create a new social contract uh, that extends beyond the pandemic? What are the policies uh, that can be steering us towards a more equitable society? And then number three, what exactly does that new social contract between governments and societies look like, or what should they look like? You're gonna be hearing from a number of lawmakers who've been leading the conversation on these issues in their respective countries. Um, but I wanna try and set the scene first to put all of this in context. And before I do that, I wanna remind all of you that at the end of this discussion, after hearing our panelists, um, we do have an opportunity to do some Q&A on the other side. So I'd encourage all of you to kind of think about some questions um, that you think could lead to sort of expanding this discussion. Uh, let's talk about the data first though, though, because it does to point to a pretty stark reality that's forming. 120 million people have been pushed to extreme poverty during this pandemic. And the UN says that number could exceed 200 million by the end of this decade because of the lasting impact of the pandemic. The World Bank came out with new numbers today on their outlook, and it shows that while the global economy is expected to expand by 5.6% this year, the low-income countries are only expected to grow about 2.9%, which would be the slowest pace in 20 years. And while we're talking about developing countries, we've also seen uh, the world's richest countries uh, see a big divide in their workforce, with women and people of color being affected disproportionately. In the U.S. alone, we've got more than 2 million women who have left the workforce, have yet to return. One in four women who are considering leaving or at least downshifting their careers, um, compare that to one in five men. And when you look at the groups that have been affected the most, at least among women, it's working mothers, women in senior management positions, and then black men, uh, black women as well. So a number of threads here that we're looking at globally that could lead to this discussion of a new social contract. I wanna get to our guests first though, um, because we've got some big names here in the discussion. Diego Mesa is a Minister of Mines and Energy over in Colombia. Marta Morgan's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada. And Raja Krishnamurti, Congressman from Illinois, right here in the US, and Abdul Ghani Kasuba, who's governor of North Maluku over in Indonesia. So let's turn it over to them first and have a discussion on the other side. Take a listen. Hello, as Colombia Minister of Energy and Mines, it's an honor and a pleasure to participate at this extraordinary meeting convened by Horace's Global Visions community. I would like to thank uh, for this space, and particularly, I would like to thank Mr. Frank Jorgen Reister for inviting me to speak about the Colombian vision on how we're fighting climate change. First, I would like to say that Colombia has increased its commitment uh, with the fight against climate change. Uh, under the Paris Agreement, we have committed before to use CO2 emissions by 20% in 2030. But as the president of Colombia, uh, President Duque, said on, on December, we're now going to decrease by 51% by 2030. We're also working to lay out the path to get to net zero by 2050. From the energy sector, we're working on many different angles. 
The first one in which we've been accelerating our efforts is the massification of variable uh, energy. And we are able to say now that in less than four years, we're going to go from less than 0.5% of our power matrix made up of variable renewable energy to 12% uh, in 2022. And this will obviously complement our matrix, which is heavily dependent on hydropower, which means we will have one of the cleanest power matrix in the whole world. We're also working on other technologies such as carbon capture, use and storage. We're also laying up the roadmap for green hydrogen and also exploring geothermal potential. We believe that all these actions from the energy sector will contribute to uh, positioning Colombia as one of the regional leaders in the fight against climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate virtually in this panel on building a new social contract. I'm going to focus my remarks today about how to make sure that we include women in this endeavor. COVID-19 has disproportionately affected the poorest and most vulnerable persons and those from marginalized communities around the world. The pandemic has also exacerbated gaps in gender equality, with women at the front lines of the response in many countries while simultaneously at risk of losing ground on economic and social empowerment. During this global crisis, women are seeing disproportionate economic and social threats, added burdens of unpaid care and domestic work, their sexual, reproductive and health rights compromised, and greater risks of sexual and gender-based violence, including online. We've also been reminded that women are not a homogenous group and that for indigenous, black and racialized women, LGBTQ2I, migrants and refugees, and women living with disabilities, the crisis has been even more challenging. It has threatened to roll back the hard-fought social and economic progress that we have made. The World Bank estimated that between 119 and 124 million people may be pushed into extreme poverty due to COVID-19, reversing development gains earned, earned over the last two decades. Women and girls already overrepresented among the world's extreme poor continue to be those hardest hit and face specific challenges such as higher job losses and greater care burdens. But for all of the challenges posed by the pandemic, it also presents us with a once in a generation opportunity to build back better. We have an opportunity to work towards achieving greater resilience, sustainability, peace, prosperity, and equality for all as envisioned in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Building back better requires bold leadership and being open to new ways of doing things. In this regard, I'm proud of the Government of Canada's steadfast commitment to an inclusive international agenda encapsulated in its feminist foreign policy. In pursuing a feminist approach over the last five years, our government has sought to place a focus not only on achieving equality of outcomes, but also to work to transform unequal power relations and structures in order to achieve lasting change. Canada's feminist foreign policy seeks to be inclusive, intersectional, transformative, and grounded in human rights. It reflects a conviction that all people should enjoy the same human rights and the same opportunities to succeed and fulfill their potential. And it contributes to the government's overall commitment to take action for inclusive, fair, and democratic societies. Canada's feminist foreign policies, programs, and initiatives have significant, tangible impacts. Our trade diversification strategy aims to extend the benefits of trade more widely, including to underrepresented groups, such as women, small and medium-sized enterprises, and Indigenous peoples. This involves working to remove barriers to trade while mainstreaming gender-responsive and inclusive provisions in free trade agreements with willing parties. We've also organized several trade missions and services that support women-owned SMEs, women entrepreneurs, and other traditionally underrepresented groups so they can access international export markets and global value chains. Canada's feminist international assistance policy places human rights, gender equality, the empowerment of women and girls, and the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development at the center of its efforts and investments. Canada is proud to have been ranked as a top donor for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls overall, as well as in support of our women's rights organizations. 
In our 2019-20 fiscal year, more than 300 women's rights organizations were supported through the Women's Voice and Leadership Initiative. Canada's second national action plan on women, peace, and security reflects the conviction that women's equal participation at all stages and at all levels of decision-making is vital for preventing and resolving violent conflict, recovering and rebuilding more inclusive societies, and addressing threats to international security. Through its flagship ELSI initiative, Canada's leading international efforts to increase the meaningful participation of uniformed women in UN missions. Bilateral training and technical assistance partnerships are delivered in countries like Zambia, Senegal, and Ghana. Across all of our government's efforts, we will continue to advance our feminist foreign policy objectives in order to build back better, prioritizing gender equality, inclusion, and respect for diversity in all of our work. We look forward to working with partners and allies, old and new, to share lessons learned and advance lasting solutions to the challenges we face at a world, as a world. Thank you again so much, and I hope that you have a very fruitful discussion on the panel today. Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy from the 8th District of Illinois. Thank you to Horasis and specifically Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter for inviting me to speak to you during your 2021 global meeting. The COVID-19 pandemic has wreaked havoc upon our global community and underserved vulnerable populations have been the most at risk for suffering during this pandemic. In looking at the job losses that the United States saw in December 2020, 100% of them were from women. That same December jobs report showed that while the unemployment rate for women overall was 6.3%, the unemployment rate for black women was 8.4%. These disparities are clear and must be addressed. And this goal applies to citizens within our own borders, as well as from country to country. That's why I've been working to ensure that the U.S. provides vaccines and medical supplies to COVID hit countries like India, and others, I've introduced my nullifying opportunities for variants to infect and decimate, also known as the NOVID Act, to fund fighting the virus abroad. In the U.S., we've seen the impact that COVID-19 relief packages have had with our $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan most recently. Once we pass this immediate hurdle of the pandemic emergency, we must move on to facilitating compassionate and global leadership and the creation of a new social contract. Together, we can foster our shared humanity. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Pertama-tama, saya ingin mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Chairman Horasis Dr. Frank Jurgen Peter yang telah memberikan kesempatan kepada kami untuk berbicara di hadapan seluruh anggota Horasis yang mengikuti Horasis Global Meeting ini. Juga kepada saudara Ananda Setiona Ivananto, seorang anggota Horasis yang telah memperkenalkan kami kepada Dr. Frank Jurgen Richard. Maluku Utara adalah salah satu provinsi termuda di Indonesia, terbentuk pada tahun 1999 Masehi di kawasan timur Indonesia yang terdiri dari lebih 1.470 pulau dengan potensi perikanan dan kelautan serta ekowisata dan indah memukau. Posisi Maluku Utara yang terletak di depan Samudra Pasifik dan dapat menjadi titik penghubung antar negara-negara Asia, negara Australia, dan Pasifik merupakan salah satu nilai strategis yang kami miliki di provinsi ini. Dalam sejarah, Maluku Utara pernah menjadi pusat perdagangan tempat rempah yang pada zamannya menjadi komoditas perdagangan utama di dunia, yaitu cengkeh dan pala. Maluku Utara didatangi oleh para pedagang tidak hanya dari wilayah-wilayah Nusantara, tetapi juga dari seluruh dunia, Eropa, Timur Tengah, dan juga dari Asia. Dan 
warisan sejarah tersebut masih tampak hingga saat ini berupa keberagaman suku bangsa yang tinggal di provinsi ini. Saat ini kami di Maluku Utara sedang bekerja keras membangun provinsi ini dengan fokus pada tiga hal. Peningkatan kualitas manusia Maluku Utara, membangun infrastruktur penyiapan birokrasi pemerintahan yang berintegritas dan profesional. Dengan harapan itu, semua akan meningkatkan daya saing Maluku Utara sebagai tempat yang dituju semua orang untuk mengembangkan bisnis dan ekonomi dan akhirnya memberdayakan dan mensejahterakan seluruh masyarakat sehingga kemudian dapat berkontribusi secara optimal pada kemajuan Indonesia dan dunia. Maluku Utara memiliki banyak potensi ekonomi yang masih sangat bisa diharapkan, terutama di sektor kelautan dan perikanan, kelautan, kehutanan, dan perkebunan, pertambangan, dan juga ekowisata karena keindahan alam yang sangat menawan. Sebagai Gubernur Maluku Utara, saya meyakini bahwa dengan mengelola potensi-potensi ekonomi secara profesional dengan tetap menjaga kelestarian, kami dapat membawa masyarakat Maluku Utara menuju masyarakat yang adil, sejahtera, dan bermartabat. Dalam membangun Maluku Utara, tentunya kami tidak bisa sendirian melakukannya. Tetapi juga bekerja sama dengan berbagai pihak agar membangun Maluku Utara dapat dilaksanakan dengan melihat contoh-contoh terbaik dari berbagai tempat di dunia dan melibatkan seluruh individu entinitas yang ingin berkontribusi pada kemajuan dan kesejahteraan Maluku Utara untuk itu melalui forum Horas Global Meeting ini saya ingin mengajak seluruh anggota Horas untuk datang ke Maluku Utara melihat sendiri apa yang sedang kami lakukan di sini dan bersama-sama dengan kami membangun Maluku Utara banyak hal yang dapat kita lakukan bersama di sini Dimulai dari pengembangan sumber daya manusia melalui peningkatan kualitas pendidikan dan perluasan wawasan manusia Maluku Utara. Kemudian pembangunan infrastruktur sampai pada pengembangan potensi bisnis dan ekonomi berbagai sektor potensial. Maluku Utara membutuhkan teknologi pengelolaan hasil produksi laut baik tangkap maupun budidaya, untuk mengembangkan sektor kelautan dan perikanan yang menjadi sektor utama Provinsi Maluku Utara ini, karena hampir 70 persen Maluku Utara adalah laut. Pandemi COVID-19 yang telah kita lalui bersama lebih dari satu tahun ini, di satu sisi memberikan dampak negatif kepada kita semua, tetapi di sisi lain, mendorong kita untuk berinovasi dalam membangun dan mengembangkan ekonomi wilayah Maluku Utara dengan berkomunikasi dan berkolaborasi menggunakan berbagai platform teknologi yang belum kita manfaatkan se sebelumnya. Saya merasa terhormat bisa bertemu dan berbicara di hadapan Bapak Ibu semua dalam platform komunikasi online ini dan berharap dapat berkomunikasi lebih lanjut untuk kebaikan dan kemanusia kemajuan kita bersama sekali lagi terima kasih dan kami dengan tangan terbuka siap bertemu dan menunggu kehadiran Bapak Ibu semua di Maluku Utara terima kasih Selamat pagi Bapak Ibu sekalian yang kami hormati dan kami cintai Labon Bajo 
merupakan ibu kota Kabupaten Manggarai Barat, Provinsi Nusa Tenggara Timur, Republik Indonesia. Labuan Bajo telah ditetapkan sebagai salah satu dari lima destinasi pariwisata prioritas di Indonesia dan menjadi satu-satunya destinasi pariwisata premium di Indonesia. Data statistik beberapa tahun terakhir menunjukkan bahwa peningkatan jumlah kunjungan wisatawan di Labuan Bajo bertumbuh dan berkembang dengan begitu besar. Namun, di tahun 2020 yang lalu, perkembangan dunia pariwisata di Indonesia dan di Labuan Bajo secara khusus sangat merosot karena terdampak oleh penyebaran virus corona. Ada beberapa langkah yang dilakukan oleh pemerintah Kabupaten Manggarai Barat untuk memutus mata rantai COVID-19. Satu, menerapkan protokol kesehatan secara ketat. Dua, melakukan tes rapid antigen secara gratis. Yang ketiga, melakukan vaksin secara massal. Kami yakin dan percaya keindahan bentangan alam Labun Bajo dan keberadaan hewan purba komodo yang merupakan tujuh keajaiban dunia, cagar geosfer dan situs warisan dunia UNESCO. Maka dalam waktu yang singkat, pariwisata Labuan Bajo yang berbasis kebudayaan dan kemasyarakatan akan kembali pulih dan akan mengalami peningkatan. Pemerintah Kabupaten Manggarai Barat berkomitmen untuk menyiapkan infrastruktur transportasi darat, laut, dan udara, serta mereformasi birokrasi yang akan menjamin keberhasilan berinvestasi di Labuan Bajo. Mari berkunjung dan berinvestasi di Labuan Bajo. Pertama kalinya Indonesia memiliki sistem kesehatan, keselamatan, dan keamanan yang terintegrasi. Mulai dari I want to thank all of our um, panelists for joining in on the discussion. I want to see if we can. Okay. Uh, wasn't sure if all the all the uh, comments had been played out there. Um, I want to thank all of our guests there um, for joining in on that discussion. It looks like there's a number of people who are looking to um, join in on this discussion. So let's see if I can kind of pass around the mic here. And uh, first, we've got um, Manuela Andaloro. I think I've passed along the mic to you. I'm trying to figure out all the technical um, issues here, but let's see if we can get you to join in on the conversation. That's right. Hi. Good evening. Good morning for you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great, great. Hi, I'm um, based in Switzerland and um, a great session so far. Very interesting. Um, um, a couple of questions uh, from my side. You know, we know that calls for, and we'll be discussing that, for, for fixing our broken social contract are, are growing everywhere across the developed and, and developing countries. But if we think in corporate terms, um, you know, um, what is the go to market strategy? The idea of a social contract is at the same time quite abstract, but also very much um, real politique. So is it possible to reconfigure the, uh, the, the many unwritten rules and patchwork of norms binding together citizens of the world? governments and nations at a global scale? Also, what countries will change? What will they do first? And 
are politicians going to release power? I work with some governments. It's, it's, it's a very complicated setup. And how can our globalized economy, my background is, is in finance, um, can even allow a re reconfiguration at, at such global scale? And, and finally, as people and as citizens, what can we actually expect from our governments? So let's see if we can open this up to the audience, because there's a number of questions in there I think are worth exploring. Um, I must go ahead and try and pass the mic here to Yulian Ivanov, who I'm seeing uh, is looking for the mic as well. So Yulian, do, do you want to weigh in on this question that Manuela just raised? Hello, Akiki. Do you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Compliments for uh, your uh, world leaders panel. It's wonderful to hear uh, opinion of the global leaders. And um, I have a, a question regarding uh, having in mind the re uh, recent uh, G7 decision for a uh, global corporate tax, uh, probably for the global vaccine coverage. Do you think that the human values can be concentrated for uh, some uh, specific uh, goals for the future, like uh, healthcare, climate, uh, climate change, and to have um, uh, better communication of our uh, human resources? Let's say in Europe, we have uh, a European Green Deal. Therefore, this is uh, one of priority in Europe. But on a global base, it will be more important to implement mm -hmm. innovation and democratization. What is your opinion about that? Yeah, Thank Julian, you. Be, before we get an answer on that, I'm wondering if you can respond to the point that Manuela raised, which is, you know, how do you get uh, politicians to work alongside uh, companies as well as sort of the, the, the nonprofits to really develop this social contract from lessons that have been learned throughout the pandemic. Do you want to weigh in on that? Yes, I, I believe it will, uh, it will be go for the future, definitely, because without communication to the world leaders, it will be difficult to have uh, common values as a human being. Therefore, I believe the democratization will help even for the corporate development and uh, on the base of uh, innovation and democratization of technology, this can be a much better future for the global development. And um, let's see if we can bring in another member of the audience here to kind of weigh in on the point that you just made, Yulian, about what was discussed over at G7 and sort of how do you put, uh, where do you place the value in this discussion, whether it is in sort of building out this strategy for sustainability, but also looking at distribution for vaccines. I've got Mahesh Kotecha here um, in the queue, and I wonder if I can call on him to weigh in on that. Mahesh, um, do you wanna weigh in on, on the points that Yulian just made about um, how we should be, I don't wanna say assigning, but looking at the, the value of, um, as we see more and more countries sort of build out their strategy post-pandemic? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to participate uh, in this small way. Uh, my uh, view is that the biggest uh, uh, challenges for the uh, return from pandemic for countries which are poor with uh, preponderance of underserved communities comes from many that have high debt burdens. We need to help them get relief from that. And the, I, I, the, the debt service suspension initiative of the G20 and the son of that, the common framework are frankly inadequate because some of those countries actually have market access. Even a country like Laos and Fiji are talking about market access. And unless they forego market access by defaulting to the private sector under the common framework, they do not get debt service relief. That is sheer uh, lunacy. Uh, I think that the, the, that the solution is to find a way to solve the problem and have the countries al allocate their freed up resources for vaccinations with a condition that the debt relief will come if they mm -hmm. do so. 
Yeah, I'm glad you brought that point because there's certainly been a lot of discussion about um, what things will look like, especially for emerging economies, developing countries. Um, we have, of course, seen governments around the world take on enormous amounts of debt coming out of this pandemic. But um, to what extent do the advanced economies really need to pick up that relief, just given the debt burden that's placed on um, those who uh, who are considered more emerging markets? Uh, Manuela, do you want to do you want to weigh in on that? Can you I, hear me? Oh, I yeah. can hear you. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. Um, so it's a it's a good question. Um, I think um, uh, so. I've been following very closely the uh, the situation in Italy, um, which is my um, my my home country. And you know, there was a very interesting statement that uh, Prime Minister Mario Draghi made uh, recently over the summer. But also, again, it's about debt, and uh, he made a distinction between good debt and bad debt, and what that mean. We know that Italy, for example, these days is at um, 160 percent of GDP, which is um, very far from Japan's 200 percent, for example, but still the <laughs> second highest in Europe. And um, however, he did reassure <laughs> markets and citizens saying that um, they, uh, the, the way that these days we view that at uh, European Central Bank level, but also uh, at country level is very different. And the distinction between good debt and bad debt that, especially today, especially because of the pandemic, must be made. Uh, mm. So that is fine as long as good debt is made and it guarantees growth and its use for sustainable growth and development. And, and so that's what I would also go for. Uh, there is no other way around right now for, for most countries. It's, it's just incredibly difficult. And slowly but surely we will come out of this. We just need strong, good strategies. Now for Europe, of course... There are a lot of recovery plans that have been announced between the end of April and May, and uh, I think some countries are finally handing in their 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 plans and and ideas. But uh, they will be implemented over the next five years, and this actually will show probably how and if Europe can be as resilient as it should be, as a, hmm. and as we all hope hope for. So yeah, that would be that would be my my take. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see as so much of, of the, the recovery's assessment, you know, it, it feels immediate. And yet, to your point, I mean, this is a five year, 10 year build out in, in something that we can only really assess down the line in terms of its effectiveness. Um, we're already running over here in the session, but I wonder if we can get one more voice uh, into the conversation. I'm looking at the requests here. Uh, Gurvinder, I know you've been waiting patiently. I'm going to see if we can get you involved in the conversation and hand the mic over to you. Okay, go. can you hear me? I can hear you. Stage is uh, yours. Well, thank you so kind and uh, thanks for a vibrant discussion. You know, um, when I look at social contracts, I, I feel that they exist uh, in order to factor in what economic drivers and economic growth could not factor in. Uh, so it provides a little bit of a safety net. It provides a little bit of an unwritten safety net. Uh, and that's how trade unions were formed and that's how environmental groups were formed. So my question is that on the one hand, we talk about stakeholder capitalism. So on a, in a stakeholder capitalism kind of a world, why is kind of new social contracts necessary? Hmm. What do you mean that by that specifically? If we're talking the trade-off here between stakeholder capitalism and then a new social contract. So if we are looking at um, traditional capitalism as having kind of bias to decision-making and power and centralization and in, you know, inequality uh, and some of the, some of the fallouts that have happened from traditional global capitalism, meaning, uh, meaning that global ca capitalism is good, uh, but then the only yardstick it uses, uses is one of money, uh, but money is not the only value proposition that people use. So when we shift from the notion of traditional capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, are we still leaving something unfinished because we are talking about stakeholder capitalism, yet we are looking for new social contracts. 
Okay. Let's see if I can bring in um, one more voice to maybe weigh in on that question, because I think it's an important one. Hopefully we can get to it before we round out. Um, Idastius Endi, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I know you've been waiting in the queue as well. Um, did you want to weigh in on this point that Gravinder just made about, you know, the trade-off between stakeholder capitalism and, and then at, at what point does a social contract replace that? Um, is it a binary decision? I don't know if we see him there. Okay, I don't think we see him there. Um, Manuela or Yulian, you want to get the, the, the last word on this one? Because I think it's an important discussion to explore. Uh, definitely. Uh, thank you uh, to give me uh, my uh, understanding about that. Having in mind my life in the US, in UK, uh, China, and uh, Eastern Europe as the emerging market, I can say that uh, I agree partially that the money is not everything on the world, but on the other side, uh, to have a social impact and to have better communication, it's not point just for the money, but the cultural cross point and for the human values for the future development. Therefore, if we going uh, together, not only for the political side between, let's say, China, India and the US, I believe uh, should be a cross point for the culture, for the human beings and for the capital. Therefore, the capital, it's important for emerging market in, in order to have economic growth and modernization. But on the other side, uh, the human relationship will take place more and more in the future. Great, I think we're gonna have to end it there. Unfortunately, we're about uh, 20 minutes over the session. So I wanna thank all of you for taking part in it. Certainly a very lively discussion. It, it's been fun because it's a bit different than the other formats we've tried um, here at Horizons. But great to talk to all of you today. And thank you so much for uh, joining us today in this discussion. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.